Greetings, everybody that's tuned into this program right now. Uh, and if you're not tuned in, uh, uh, you probably aren't hearing me. So uh, this is Arts and Sciences Telluride 2024, named uh, that way because 45 years ago, I organized Arts and Sciences Telluride 1979. And uh, there are a number of other uh, occasions uh, here in this community and uh, where I live in Santa Fe. It's the 40th year of uh, Santa Fe Institute this year. Remarkable uh, institution. It's the 40th year of the Telluride Institute and it's the 40th year of the Telluride Science Organization. Uh, and uh, so in part, we're commemorating those things locally in terms of community building and uh, fostering a sense of community and sharing this with community. But we're also sharing this globally with uh, all of the people on the laser uh, network. And uh, welcome. Uh, today and this session, this laser, this is one of uh, 12 laser uh, Zoom sessions with some remarkable individuals all in one way or another talking about and presenting work that addresses the nature of information. Uh, a simple word that we use in so many ways and that is such a fundamental part of reality as, as we can understand it. Um, today, um, we've, we're, I've just generally called this session Artful Intelligence Number Two, since we had an earlier Artful Intelligence session. And um, our guests today uh, are Sean Brixey from Virginia, Virginia, and uh, where? And Sean, where in Virginia are you right now? Are you at the university or at home? Or I'm actually in my. Um, um home laboratory studio. I've got an offsite lab, uh, but generally on uh, most days I'm in engineering uh, or in one of the million square feet of the art school somewhere uh, doing research, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in my home lab right now. And, and so at Virginia Commonwealth University, Virginia Commonwealth where, University. We're in Virginia. We're in Virginia. It's Richmond, Virginia. I'm the retired Dean of the school of the arts and, and I'll, I'll, I'll share that in a minute. Uh, but um yeah, Richmond, Virginia. I'm in Henrico, which is just across the street from Richmond. Oh, good. All right. And we also have uh, with us today, uh, Joshua Garland, who uh, is in Colorado Springs, uh, but also is a researcher at Arizona State University, among other endeavors. And uh, two very different presentations that we've grouped together today. Some of the presentations have been very uh, in sync in a way. We just had a conversation with three physicists, but right now, uh, uh, just uh, we're just filling time uh, with uh, the most inspiring and informative and hopefully life-changing presentations. So Sean Brixey, take it away to start with. Oh, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, it's great connecting with you and in the green room. It was really fun uh, hanging out with Josh as well. And so appreciative of everybody at ASU for, um, uh, you know, writing the controls on all the presentations. So welcome everyone. Um, this is my second Artful Intelligence uh, presentation. Uh, the, the title of this lecture or the title of this presentation, uh, it's informal, but I like, to, I like to think of it as different than the last one by quite a bit, because I'll talk more about robotics, uh, but I'll kind of lead up to why. And so it's called, Telematic Frontiers, Magnaforma, and the Art of Being Here. Um, so I'm Sean Brixey. I'm a prof professor of art and engineering. I'm the former dean of the art school at Virginia Commonwealth University and former dean of a lot of universities. Um, MIT educated artist, researcher, inventor, scientist, engineer. I work primarily at the interface of art, science, and technology. I like to think that I pioneer experimental artworks that synthesize physics, astronomy, cosmology, biology, advanced computing, um, I've created installations for Documenta, the Winter Olympics, Cranbrook Art Museum, Chicago Art Institute, Smithsonian, European Union, Capital of Culture, received lots of grants, um, uh, Adobe, Apple, uh, the NSF, the NEA, Rockefeller, uh, and other folks like that. The thing that I wanted to talk a bit about is telematics. Um, 
And uh, I've worked in the field of telematics for almost 35, 40 years. Uh, people often uh, don't know what telematics is. And you know, telematics is fundamentally derived from sort of a mashup between the telematic French and the uh, and the tele telecommunications and informatic sort of merging telecommunications with informatics. And so, by combining these fields, telematics sort of becomes the art and science of data acquisition, transmission, reception, real time processing, insight, feedback. Uh, manual and automatic operation, remote operation, decision making for network devices worldwide. All of this allows real time analysis to enhance system efficiencies, human experience, especially of the real and physical worlds. Uh, the field encompasses so many things, not just network devices, but sensing and control systems, industrial robotics, farming equipment, haptic feedback systems that all enable these sort of immersive remote experiences and precision interaction with distant environments, bridging gaps between physical presence and remote operation. Um, People often confuse, well, telepresence is actually a procedural embodiment, one procedural embodiment in the field of telematics. And what often happens is, you know, telepresence is understood in a lot of different ways, uh, but um, it was defined by Marvin Minsky, who is a professor of mine, as the experience of being in a real location, remote from one's true location. Now, now you like to even drill down farther and just simply say, it's the experience of being there, right? That's what telepresence is. The problem with telepresence, however, and we're doing it right now is people think that we're doing telepresence when in fact we're sort of doing high resolution um, teleconferencing, right? <clears throat> and when you see telepresence, uh, you don't really think of it unless maybe you've gone under the knife like with a surgical robot, um, and even that's in close proximity, uh, probably a really good example uh, or a diagram would be you've got the house on the right, you've got a university, you've got a satellite, you've got a NOAA ship, uh, you've got, you know, remote devices that sort of help um, uh, control things at a distance, but there's not a lot of, you know, forced feedback, uh, a lot of uh, sort of the presence of actually fully physically being there. It's just remote control video. Whereas something like you have, like with the Mars Rover, you actually have people who don gloves and helmets uh, and they physically sort of move around. They get a sense of, you know, the amount of resistance on a wheel, uh, even though there's latency. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very different kind of experience. I'll show a couple of projects really quickly to give you a sense of how broad I interpret telepresence and telematics. Uh, the first project uh, is Photon Voice. Uh, we're all taught in school that um, uh, it takes eight and a half minutes for, for a photon to leave from the surface of the sun to get to Earth, 94 million miles. The one thing that most people are really not taught, though, is that photons have no mass, but when they um, actually strike an object, they can impart their kinetic momentum to it. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's cognitively dissonant, right? To say it has no weight yet, however, it can strike something. Now, if it strikes a shiny surface, it's twice the amount of force. So on a clear day in the in the desert, when the sun strikes the earth, it's about six pounds per square mile. If it was a mirror, it would be 12 pounds per square mile. So what I did uh, for Smithsonian World Television, it was funded by the NEA, is I put together a battery of mirrors which track the sun for so many minutes a day, and it calculates the exact amount of radiation pressure, which is sent to a device on the right-hand part of the screen, that big lens then condenses the light down to absolutely infinitesimally small points of light. And uh, inside of a, an evacuated flask, there's a, 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 a clear glass uh, flask with a piezoelectric transducer, some graphite particles. And when the sun comes in and they slam apart and they break apart and they look just like shimmering uh, sort of stars floating. But because the force of the light, which is three thousandths of a gram of radiation pressure, is stronger than gravity pressing down on them, they actually form over time a flat oblate disk following the exact same patterns that you see in celestial mechanics, whether it is a solar system forming or a galaxy forming. Each one of the particles that you see right here spinning on their own axis, uh, there's no um, uh, atmosphere in there, so there are no radiometric forces. Now, what happens is that if we go back a slide, the dancer actually moves between these mirrors, which are slightly tilted, so they form interocular separation like stereo hands, the same way that the da Vinci robot would be, except I'm operating at just the interaction of photons with electrons and matter, 
creating these uh, tiny galaxies. On the right side of her, you'll see something that looks like a hexagonal star. And those are mirrors that are covered, or those are speakers covered with mirrorized mylar. And the audio coming through there actually contains the audio that goes into the um, levitation. Uh, another project that I'll talk about is Chimera Obscura. And it is a, um, a telerobot. This was designed in 1998. And for those of you who have been around long enough know that there were no streaming codecs that were stable in 1998. Even the federal government, much less the military or NASA had no robots that could be controlled uh, except over a very private network. This is controlled over a public network, allowing millions of users to come in and basically navigate through a giant maze that's made of a human thumbprint. And this was done for Genesis, which was an exhibition uh, funded by the gentlemen uh, who were sort of um, fighting it out over uh, parallel processing or serial processing for uh, the Human Genome Project. Um, and the exhibition basically had a series of projects that dealt with this, but mostly photographs and things like that, that sort of, you know, relied on the, the, the metaphors of genetics. Whereas this is actually a human thumbprint that you can navigate using a, a browser. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a bunch of triangles, which are really your navigation controls, your cardinal directions. The upper right-hand corner is actually the view that you receive. You can, at any point in time, actually on the A, which is audio T, which is text G, graphic, or C cinema layers, lay in these, we called them memes before memes were even uh, a thing to be talked about uh, 24 years ago. And you had an infinite Z axis, which would allow you, in essence, to leave breadcrumbs, right? Uh, however, there was a mathematical minotaur that roamed the maze that would mutate the data. So every time that you would come back, it would look familiar because you were in the same location, but some of the data had ever so slightly, I won't say been corrupted, it had been modified or changed. And what we really did is we recorded the way in which people discovered spaces that they had never been in. And we used that as the core of some of our early, early artificial intelligence uh, practices that inform other projects. You can sort of see here part of the thumbprint from a, a screen capture that uh, on our end, we might be seeing there's 942 visitors or 942 layers uh, within inside of one of the colors, which is a specific, probably a text layer, uh, et cetera. There's a short movie here that I will not uh, uh, play too much of, but you can see a little bit. I'll scrub through uh, literally 8,000 uh, working parts to put it together, six different custom uh, languages. And of course this was commissioned in 98 and it rolled out in 02. Uh, I think that there is a, um, yeah. It was on, um, a TV show uh, called Secrets of the Sequence. Prince. This spring, the Henry Art Gallery. I'll go ahead and push through uh, some other projects. The next project that I... Um, I'm talking about is called Voltaire. It was done for the uh, Euro the uh, European Union's Capital of Culture. Uh, when we are children, uh, we're told that no two snowflakes are alike, and that's true because they are atomic recordings of the histories of their lifetimes as they fall. If Joshua and I or Richard and I fell very close to each other in Telluride in the mountains, uh, and you caught us in two hands on you know dark gloves, you would see that we're quite similar, but not the same. Uh, we grow through surface tension, heat dissipation, supersaturation, turbidity, contamination, et cetera. But I developed technology in the laboratory that allowed me to create water that's so pure it's the same kind of water, basically, that we use in semiconductor manufacturing and biotech, but it's so pure it doesn't know how to freeze anymore. And what I've done is I've taken ice core samples from the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago and pulled small fragments out, and we use those to dope them the same way that you would a semiconductor um, to create a clone of a moment in time from 20,000 years ago. 
So it takes uh, some fairly sophisticated engineering, uh, some uh, uh, and to have uh, the ice core sample shipped in, and of course not to thaw. There's a special freezer. Uh, the panels where they grow inside are so perfect uh, that they can't trigger the uh, nucleation themselves. Uh, and you'll see on the far left hand side, uh, on the on the left side where the gentleman's viewing into the uh, freezer, there's a robotically controlled camera that would allow you to take photographs, flip them over, send postcards. This is what one of the crystals look like. Um, certainly not anything that you're going to see in your refrigerator. Um, and the beauty of it is, is the epitaxy, which is the atomic similarity between water that's colder than freezing and ultra pure and ice that's already been frozen, but it's uh, lattice has been compressed because it's been, you know, under pressure for thousands of years when the two match they're only at about 95% accuracy. So when they grow from very small to very large, what ends up happening is they stress the atomic lattice and this information, right? The history of uh, the story of these ice crystals can be learned through quantum electrodynamics using uh, some simple math to determine sort of the colors that we're seeing and how much stress is being placed on the lattice. The project that we were talking about in the green room is called Altamira. Um, I like to think that humans are more than 100-year biological vessels where million-year creatures embedded in a billion-year process. And so um, when we were small children, a lot of us pressed on our eyes and we would get those fantastic colors uh, from uh, mechanical phosphines, which are sodium and potassium ions that cascade down the optic nerve to produce uh, uh, an impression in the brain that we think of as light. But here I use the very large array in Saco, New Mexico, Sirocco, New Mexico, and uh, at Haystack in Massachusetts to uh, capture signals that are coming from uh, pulsars, which are uh, collapsed stars that are very dense and they rotate violently in space and they produce a beacon of uh, radio energy that has a pulse periodicity and signature that mirrors a very similar kind of structure that would be necessary to trigger those phosphines. So I use an, a, a device that's similar to a, a cell phone that wires you up with galvanic electrodes on your um, temples and your occiputs. And then I basically just wet jack you into the universe. This is a still, we can't get a picture out of your head, but our computer models are pretty accurate and this is what it looks like. This is the information encoded in stars, uh, you know, 125 million years uh, old that are already dead and gone. And, uh, and yet, however, we're still telematically connected uh, to uh, our origins. The last project before I jump into the new project Magnaforma is Eon. Uh, basically, it uses voice modulated high frequency ultrasound to create an improbable star in a jar. If you look on the left hand side, there's basically imagine two loudspeakers, but they're just so loud that if you put your hand in there, it would crush it. And the force field's in the shape of uh, an hourglass, like two pyramids being smashed together. I uh, break apart the oxygen and the hydrogen, and I allow a bubble to drift up, and I capture it, and then I crush it at near relativistic speeds, very, very fast. And when it does so, the interface between the air and the water become out of phase and they release um, light uh, that when we put it in front of a prism, no one in the world knows where it comes from because it should have oxygen and hydrogen absorption lines, but it doesn't, it's a black body. However, on the right-hand side, you'll see stereo microscopes and some wires coming in, and I allow anyone in the world to send a text message and their voice is, or their text is converted into voice. The voice is uses a subcarrier, which then produces the force field that produces the light, and their voice comes out of a light source that's coming from someplace in the universe that not even really good physicists or myself fully know from. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not an electric light bulb that's turned off and on. It is really, truly from some other place. So going back to telepresence, I'd like to think of it that I come through it uh, to telepresence legitimately. My dad uh, was an actor on Broadway. My mom, a symphony cellist. After World War II, they um, pioneered television uh, in the United States with lots of shows that everybody loves. So I grew up on the floor of a TV studio. I was um, you know, telepresent my entire life as a kid. I did television commercials uh, for all the major brands. So I always saw myself as being telepresent in, you know, other people's uh, lives and homes uh, and situations. I was very disappointed to learn that my parents actually didn't teleport people. And I think that my work uh, ever since then has tried to uh, recover some of that disappointment. I went to the Kansas City Art Institute. Uh, the artwork that I wanted to make was impossible. So I went to MIT, studied at the Media Lab under um, uh, Stephen Benton, who's the inventor of uh, white light holography, all the holograms that uh, uh, we all carry around in our wallets. 
I also worked with Otto Pina. I was the last graduate student of Edgerton, Harold Edgerton, and of course, of Marvin Minsky. Now, the reason I wanted to kind of go through this tour, and then I'll go quickly through the last project, um, and the term telepresence was coined by Minsky in 80, and so the zeitgeist around MIT was really, you know, this whole notion of being, you know, in a real location remote from your true location, but it had to do with teleoperations of, uh, for manipulating, you know, uh, remote physical objects and systems at a distance. You can see even the size of the crude video cameras in those days. So... If you think of it, the experience of being in a real location remote from one's true location is being there. However, when COVID hit, my son was on Zoom like we are, you know, uh, eight hours a day, and he would come and sit in my lap afterwards, and I would look at him, and I would get this very strange sensation. He looked almost like a businessman. He sort of had that the computer face that we all got. And I remember that he, his classmates are so close that they literally can reach out and touch each other next door. But I thought to myself, because they could, it might as well be Mars, right? It might, it's so far away. And uh, when I was a child growing up, of course, you know, the moon landing, the um, uh, NASA, the Apollo missions, they were a part of not just national pride or our competition with the Russians, but really sort of, you know, uh, a humanity's attempt to sort of touch the face of God uh, with the rush towards Mars now, you know, it's very different. And you almost think of it being the sole domain of, of, uh, of uh, megalomaniacal millionaires or billionaires. And so I had this notion, I was toying around with the concept of being there when it just struck me that if I took one letter away, it could be being here. And that's a radically different concept. So if telepresence, right, is the experience of being in a real location remote from one's true location, being here is the experience of a remote location fully present in one's true location. So it simply changes a single layer, but also the orientation. So instead of going to a place where you're not, which has been sort of the goal of telepresence since its birth, it rather actually is bringing that place to exactly where you are. So I'm going to jump out to the uh, internet. We're going to uh, swap out uh, to a browser and I'm going to stop share. And then I'm going to introduce to you all the project uh, Magnaforma. Now uh, it's on a website. Can everyone see this? Can I have thumbs up emojis that it all looks good? Is this okay? I'm not seeing, there we are. Oops, and show. I'm gonna, yeah, get back to uh, my browser. So powered by Curiosity AI and using modified rapid prototyping and industrial manufacturing techniques, Magnaform is a large scale industrial robotic arm that creates and poetically explores a full color, full scale, 144 million square kilometer, three dimensional twin of Mars on Earth. So this is not VR, everybody, right? This is a robot completely constructing the entire planet here on Earth. And so if I can't get there, right, um, why not bring it here? And so, you know, Mars is one of the most thoroughly explored planets in the solar system. Uh, it exhibits all kinds of wild features, colors, et cetera. And we have uh, 23 NASA missions and 450,000 gigabytes of data. So using this sort of very different orientation to the concept of rapid prototyping and industrial manufacturing, we use a massive nine uh, ton robot arm, robotic arm, to actually uh, reconstruct the entire surface of the planet but it uses AI and Curiosity AI to allow it to almost linger and to interpret the surface. So you're seeing sort of an early model. We have full laboratory models now working. We basically use this data from the 23 missions to Mars to create a complex 3D uh, environment where the robot can play and explore. Uh, the, uh, it carries a giant square planchette uh, that carries all of the color data, the photo. Uh, photogrammetry data, the, the color photo data uh, from the surface. Uh, and it does a spatial resolution of one kilometer and it does one kilometer per second, which will take four and a half years. Here is a um, uh, rendering of it. You can think of it as similar to rapidly changing frames in a film. 
the LEDs construct a planet-sized object by spatially mirroring the three-dimensional surface features of the surrounding terrain and accurately reproducing its colors. The process results in this sort of, you know, Tyrell-esque abstract mirage-like window that reflects both the robot's place and time on the planet. If you can sort of, I'm gonna pause the video. If you see the legend here, where the planchette uh, clips through the upper atmosphere, the horizon and the surface, that's where the colors sort of relate. If you think of it, it's really a lot like gliding across the surface of the planet like a snowboarder. Uh, the planchette traverses sort of a three-dimensional volume of layered colors derived from the surface horizon and sky data from NASA. Uh, and this is a small video of actual captured uh, light from the photogrammetry uh, of the surface right here. And of course, the upper atmosphere going through everything from uh, sandstorms, et cetera. Uh, it's not a physical encounter. It's not didactic or demonstrative. It's not meant to be a scientific experiment. It evokes very proprioceptive uh, um, sensations. It emerges really as an unsettling and sublime experience. It's the juxtaposition of its physical size, which even though it's large is not the size of a, of a planet, but its conceptual scale defies logic because you've got this unassuming industrial robot quietly constructing a full scale celestial body right before our eyes. Yet it feels slightly anthropomorphically familiar, majestic, ephemeral. Here's the robot learning um, uh, basically to use Curiosity AI developed for Magnaforma in sort of very imaginative and interpretive ways of the NASA data. Uh, I know I'm pressing the time here. Here's the uh, rig uh, testing out the early LED displays. Uh, we developed a new Unity-based uh, animation learning environment for programming it. So the ability to program any robot, industrial uh, or small cobot, uh, can be done simply through a VR headset. And also, we just won an award. We've won two awards for now moving it uh, to not using your smartphone, basically, with parametric controls, but simply it just follows it and tracks its movement. So anyone in the world who doesn't know anything about robotics can record um, any motion that they want. We have uh, snap to grid editing, uh, which allows us to slow them down, to uh, fade the movements together, et cetera. But the robot will use this basically to um, uh, uh, move across the model of the topography. We even have a new technology that uh, allows for very large industrial robots which normally have to be behind laser light cages, um, you know, high, high safety environments. We use a millimeter wave radar uh, that will allow the robot to move around you and to completely um, uh, miss you so that you can be in and around those spaces. Um, Magnaforma kind of grows out of a lot of different art lineages, especially experimental ones. I like to think of it as expanding the monumental, uh, romantic monumentality of Robert Smithson, the deepens the perceptual psychology of James Turrell, the algorithmic spaces of Myelin, and of course, the computational choreography of William Forsyth. Uh, we had to build a special laboratory for it. A bunch of graduate students are, of course, uh, working on it around the clock. Um, and um, our successes uh, have been uh, really, really wonderful to sort of, you know, watch. Uh, um, we've won, as I said earlier, um, uh, two of the uh, Capital Region um, uh, Design Engineering Expos uh, for Computer Science. And these are not trivial uh, sort of CS problems, right? Robots are not designed to do this. They're not designed uh, to, you know, dodge people. Uh, they're not designed to uh, to do the work that we're doing. And we have a number of locations that we're getting ready to exhibit the work at LSU um, and uh, Baton Rouge and other institutions. And so that's where I'm going to just say thank you and stop my share and come back to my team. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, everybody who's online. Thank you, Sean. Uh, in fact, uh, you could take more time if you like, but it leaves us more time for discussion afterwards. Uh, since we only have two primary presenters in this session, you have much more time. So I hope... I, I, I wanted to go a little uh, short so that Joshua could do his, and then we could have really a conversation, which is what I think everybody's been hoping for. So I'm, I'm excited. Beautiful. Uh, Joshua Garland researcher at Arizona State University, dealing with um, 
some really difficult aspects of our information society at a uh, human social earth scale. Uh, his, his work is not about Mars necessarily or about like our last uh, set of presentations, not about the cosmos. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I'm gonna hand it off to Joshua. He'll tell you more about himself and about uh, the work he and colleagues are doing and, and some of the implications of that, which are very uh, both uh, fascinating, but also concerning. So Joshua. Thanks, Richard. Um, like Richard said, I'm Joshua. And I found it interesting because we had uh, just had a talk and were completely different topics, but there was some connections. Um, the first being that my PhD advisor's PhD advisor was Marvin Minsky. So I guess Sean and I are somehow academically related, which is awesome. And I also think looking at his ice core work and found that incredibly interesting because I spent about 10 years studying the, predict or the predictive capacity of information interior to ice cores and trying to understand how to predict the future using uh, ancient paleo cores. Um, so hopefully we get to talk about that a little bit. And But I'm not going to talk to you guys about that kind of information today. What I'm going to talk to you about is disinformation and information warfare. Um, Richard asked me to say uh, a little bit about myself. And so I started my career as a pure mathematician. Um, I got a master's degree in applied mathematics from University of Colorado. I then transitioned to get a PhD in computer science, focusing on data analytics, also at the University of Colorado. Um, and then I just drove a few miles down the road to the Santa Fe Institute, where I was a postdoc studying complex adaptive systems. Um, following my postdoc, I got a professorship at Arizona State University uh, working at a center studying narrative disinformation and strategic influence operations. Uh, and currently, I'm the director of that research center. So I want to tell you a little bit about that research center, um, the Center on uh, Narrative Disinformation and Strategic Influence. We're located within the Global Security Initiative. The vast majority of our funding comes from the Department of Defense. Um, and within our center, what we do is we conduct interdisciplinary research. So we try to get as many different disciplines as possible to address this highly socio-technical problem, um, to understand how, uh, and our fundamental research focus is to try to understand how narrative shapes reality and how manipulations of the information environment threaten democratic norms and institutions. And I'm happy to talk about that uh, at scale. And so, uh, because this is only a 15 to 20 minute talk, I'm not going to really deep dive into any of the kind of work that we're doing. Instead, I wanted to provide points of discussion and we could take these points of discussion into the general discussion. But what I want to do is go over each question with you um, and then basically give you my take on it. And then we can, of course, discuss it uh, in more detail as the night progresses. Um, first, we're going to talk about what is an what is mis- and disinformation, how we define that, so we're all on the same page. Um, then I wanna talk about what makes disinformation effective. You know, another way of looking at that, or another aspect of that, is why do we choose to consume disinformation? I'll also talk about whether it's possible to heal after information warfare, um, and if it is or isn't, how can we counter in our disinformation campaigns? So the first thing, you know, being a mathematician is I want definitions. So let's get a really concrete definition of what mis- and disinformation is. And I think the easiest way to describe that is through the following graph. So if you look over to the green side, this is just information. The way we just, is information represents the entire, or, uh, the entire coordinate plane. Uh, the x-axis goes from uh, not misleading to misleading and no intent in the y-axis is no intent to deceive and intent to deceive. Um, notice that the top left quadrant is blank because it's impossible um, to be not misleading while also having an intent to deceive. And so what you can do is start eliminating quadrants of this plane and you can kind of build up to mis and disinformation. So if you look at the right side, the right side of this plane, whether you have all of the information is misleading uh, or false information, but you don't care at all if there's an intent to deceive or not. So whether the person's trying to be deceptful, uh, deceitful or not, um, if it's misleading information or incorrect information, you consider that misinformation. Uh, the top right quadrant is sort of the one that 
a lot of people think about is, and especially think about as like the most damaging, and it's an aspect of information warfare, is information that's misleading, and it's it's basically built with the intent to deceive you. So it's not just that they're wrong, they're trying to trick you. Um, so that kind of seems really obvious, right? Like there's wrong information and there's wrong information that's intended to deceive you. But the problem is that there's, it's kind of the devil in the detail. So um, these are really challenging things to define because intent, for example, is not always if ever clear. So I don't know why somebody posted something. Perspective is also an interesting aspect. Is misinformation in the eye of the creator, the sender, or the beholder? And I think that, you know, one thing that's not spoken about very much at all in uh, mainstream media is that information is not always static, it's evolving. And what that means is that when we think about mis and disinformation, it has a temporal component. So, you know, something that was misinformation yesterday, we may now better understand it scientifically today, and it's real information. And the same thing goes today. What we thought was real information today may be misinformation in the future because science or technology evolved to a point where we now understand it better. And so it's important to know that information and information's truth uh, is not something that's true for, the, for all of time. Okay, so one point of discussion I'd like to have is you know, really questioning what makes disinformation effective. And from my standpoint, probably because I look at this all day, is that there's just list after list after list of what makes information effect or makes disinformation effective. One of the primary things that we think about at our research center is um, the disinformation is effective when it plays into a cultural or personal narrative. So this kind of makes sense in retrospect, but if you think about your susceptibility to a particular piece of information, if it satisfies um, what you think about the world, um, you'll absorb this information a lot better. Um, a really easy way to think about it is if I wanted to deceive a Republican or I wanted to deceive a Democrat, I would present that information in a much different way. So disinformation that resonates with the cultural per or personal narrative is a lot more effective. We'll also get into the next slides. Uh, we'll get into the fact that um, it's effective when it confirms some societal, cultural, or cognitive bias. We're always trying to escape our cognitive dissonance, and that makes information useful. Um, repetition, we'll go over this, the information is sticky. Uh, most disinformation or information worker campaigns have a reliance on information overload, which we'll talk about. And we'll talk a lot less about targeted delivery and supporting media. Um, but there's many more ways. It's the problem is that there's a lot of things that make disinformation effective. And as you'll see, there's very few that can counter it. So the one thing with information is useful that I'd like to talk about um, is that we generally seek out information that's useful to us for some reason, uh, but not always because it's truthful. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of times we want to be freed from cognitive dissonance. So if there's something in our world that doesn't quite jive with the way that we think, we seek out information to assuage that dissonance. Um, this is often called the demand side of disinformation. So there's a lot of economic thinking about disinformation where there's a supply side and a demand side. What this means, that the demand side of disinformation is that people want to be manipulated uh, from an information warfare standpoint so that they can understand the reality in a way that resonates with their own personal narrative. Uh, another thing that makes or makes uh, disinformation effective is that information is sticky. The fact of the matter is the more we hear something, the more we think it's true, even if there's a truth value placed on that bit of information. So if I told you three different times, it's not true that Biden has three cats, but I just kept repeating it to you, and then you heard that bit of information a month or two months later, your brain would say, oh yeah, I remember that. Biden has three cats, even though I told you that statement's not true. This is a very common technique of uh, uh, disinformation. Uh, the Russians, for example, call this the fire, or the <laughs> fire hose of falsehoods. And there's other aspects of sticky information that we won't have time to get into. Um, the other issue is that digital information overload is real. So 
you know, this is always, this is about two to three minutes, it seems like, of all of our lives. You're constantly getting information and push notifications. People are talking to you. There's graphs you have to digest, news articles, social media posts. And somehow as humans, we're supposed to like understand and digest this. And this is simply not the kind of information environment that we evolved to be a part of. And it, it can be so defeating at times because how do you sift through this? How do you know which outlets are true information? Who can be trusted? What can be trusted? And the fact of the matter is that this information overload is an ideal environment for disinformation campaigns to take hold. Because all you have to do is slip in a little bit of information, a little bit of information. We know that information's sticky. We know people are seeking out information, whether it's true or false. And then you can have disinformation campaigns that really take hold. And then the question that feels really relevant to me these days is that, okay, what happens when we add artificial intelligence to all this? I think in my opinion that there's a disinformation AI landscape that really has three categories. The first is targeted delivery. This is using artificial intelligence to learn everything there's possible to know about you as an individual and then deliver content that they know for a fact will resonate with you as an individual. Um, so given what I just talked about in terms of efficacy, uh, this is, it's very obvious how this would play out. The other, um, issue is through creation and dissemination. So large language models, for example, have, uh, the ability to create massive amounts of text at scale, um, and then seamlessly disseminate them using bots and artificial intelligence. Um, so the problem is that disinformation and actors that want to use disinformation to deceive the public can now do so at massive scale. And if in people are interested, we can talk about how uh, AI-generated propaganda is actually more effective than human-generated propaganda. Um, and then the last aspect is sort of the good guys. So this is trying to detect and then counter disinformation. So the first two are being used against uh, people, and the third one is being used to protect against disinformation. One thing that really, that I just wanna talk about that I have no answers for is that can society be healed post-information warfare? And if they can, how? So let's make that a little bit more concrete uh, with a particular case study. And so recently I had the opportunity to go to Ethiopia um, for a very particular reason is that Ethiopia was a democratic society, still is, um, but polluted information environments, AKA uh, disinformation campaigns resulted in a loss of a shared reality for three northern regions in Europe or uh, in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, as a result, a war broke out called the Tigray War uh, in November of 2020. A major cause of this war was disinformation campaigns about the neighboring region's uh, ethnicity. And those three regions were Tigray, Amkara, and Afar. Currently, that war is in a ceasefire at least on paper, there's still a lot of battle that's occurring. And what uh, the Ethiopian colleagues that I was working with were interested in is like, how do you reverse or heal information warfare? And the way you can kind of think about this is, imagine a civil war broke out like it did in Ethiopia, but disinformation has been polluting both sides' minds forever. So you could kind of think about the Republicans and the Democrats, they, they don't have a sheer reality anymore. You can talk about January 6th, and if you're talking to a lot of Republicans, they'll say it was a peaceful tour of the Capitol. If you talk to a Democrat, they'll say it was an insurrection to overthrow the United States government. So now imagine with that sort of division in a non-shared reality, that then now those people start shooting each other and killing each other's family members in very violent acts. And then you ask them to come to the table and resolve their... Uh, there are sort of cognitive differences and rejoin the reality. And so how do you reheal um, after an information warfare, especially when it's coupled to actual warfare? Um, because healing may or may not be possible. Another thing I think about a lot is um, can information warfare be countered or can disinformation campaigns be countered?
I think that there's basically three ways that they can currently be countered. Uh, notice the stark contrast with the number of ways disinformation can be countered and the number of disinformation strategies that are highly effective. Um, and I think that's kind of telling about how this war is going. Uh, the first way that I look at um, countering disinformation is through media literacy. And media literacy is a bunch of different techniques and practices and abilities to access, analyze, evaluate, or access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. So it's taking that information overload and being able to kind of parse it for what's information and what's noise. And there's a bunch of different techniques in this that we can talk about if anybody's interested. The other thing I'm very interested in is citizen-driven counter-speech campaigns. And the way that this can be thought of very simply is it's just assertive responses by everyday citizens to disinformation. So you see disinformation online, and as a citizen, you respond to the disinformation instead of it being um, just deleted or censored, which causes all sorts of problems. So you're effectively democratizing the combating of disinformation. <laughs> What's interesting is there's a lot of strategies. Um, and I won't go into all of them, but one is interesting is providing context. So um, on the on the left, you see a tweet by Zero Hedge that says Zelensky says no, uh, or sorry, Zelensky says no elections in Ukraine until the war is over. And Elon Musk, who has quite a few followers and uh, said like, this is interesting, right? With that emoji, 3.3 million people viewed his tweet. And what the implication of this tweet is, obviously, is that Zelensky's a fascist and he uh, tried to over or like cancel democracy. So what a user did was it replied with con context and said, well, actually, according to the Ukrainian constitution, article 11, no elections are held while martial law is still in effect. So with this disinformation effectively pushing this fascist uh, argument, then someone comes in as a counter speaker, provides context, and you actually see that like, no, he's actually following his democratic constitution. He's not being a fascist. The last thing I wanna talk about is fire with fire. So it's basically how do you counter generative AI, uh, usually using AI. Um, this is something I've worked on for the last uh, two or three years. Um, and basically it's trying to detect, attribute and characterize uh, AI manipulated or generated media. And of course, uh, AI manipulated media is not necessarily disinformation. I created a lot of AI, AI images for this talk and none of them are disinformation. But the fact of the matter is, in the years to come, a lot of AI manipulated and generated media will indeed be disinformation. Um, so just some of, some of the verbiage, uh, detection is just telling, is it human or is it AI? Uh, and there's a lot of great algorithms being developed um, that allow you to differentiate human from AI generated media. Uh, the fact of the matter is it's an arms race. Um, accuracy is not always reliable. And as soon as you have a good detector, you have even better AI. As soon as you have better AI, you have better detector and better detectors give you better AI. And so it's just this arms race that they're both getting better. Uh, and I don't know where it's gonna end up. Attribution is kind of simple. It's just who manipulated the media. So that's just identifying either the generator or the actor. And then there's characterization, which is sort of the holy grail of the intelligence community. Um, this is something they've been trying to do for decades, not just with AI uh, media, but with every media. Um, and what it, what the crux of characterization is, is to identify the intent of the manipulation. So it's not to identify that there was manipulation, is it's why was the person uh, manipulating the media in the first place. And I think the easy way to understand this and why I think characterization is not something we'll ever see actually happen or be highly accurate is consider the image on the bottom with a man and a woman. And so you use AI to remove the man from the image uh, on the right. And now the question is, the characterization is that, okay, AI manipulated this image. Why did they manipulate the image? So one argument could be that the woman just wanted a nice picture by herself on this mountainside. 
that's completely benign. Um, you know, the intent is just, you know, okay, I want a nice picture. But it could be that the man was removed from the picture because that's her ex-boyfriend and she doesn't want her husband to know. Now this is suddenly a malicious intent. But from the image on the right, you can't tell the characterization one way or the other because that information is simply not present. There's no predictive, there's no predictive capacity, whether the woman was just being wanting a nice picture or whether she was cheating on her husband. Thank you guys very much. That's all I have for today. Thank you, Joshua. Um, I'm sort of provoked to tell a personal story. Um, since we have time, I will, uh, even though this is not about me as a presenter. Uh, in the 1970s, I, among other things, uh, did a series of projects with the help of NASA and various NASA facilities uh, that really dealt with information in its most basic forms, basic information theory, cybernetics, signal, input, output, just the fundamentals, uh, monitoring and sensing our world, our, our bodies, uh, and uh, translating or transducing that into other forms. Uh, by the mid-80s, I switched over to another aspect of my own uh, path of uh, exploring the information environment, and I decided to delve into the dark side uh, and explore creatively um, surveillance, privacy, information warfare, and even terrorism. Uh, this was 1984 to the early 90s, but continued beyond that. As part of that work, I embedded myself at a time when security seemed, in retrospect, pretty lax. Uh, and I, I had uh, working relationships with the Pentagon, uh, with uh, defense contractors, many defense, so-called defense contractors, or really offense contractors often, and uh, uh, military research labs like Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and uh, Wright-Patterson in Ohio, and uh, uh, Martin Marietta, and uh, yeah, just many, and access remarkably, access to remarkable uh, tools, technologies that are part of that work, uh, FLIR systems, night vision systems, computer speech and speech recognition, uh, all were part of actually a, a major installation that I did that was invited to the Venice Biennale in 1986 as part of their big show uh, that year on Informatique. And uh, I believe uh, the work I did in Venice was uh, to date the only uh, artwork ever censored and shut down within 10 days of the opening. Uh, it detailed the entire, I worked like a journalist uh, and uh, research and information. I have no clearances of any kind. Uh, I rely on rapport with individuals uh, to make things happen for doors to open and, uh, and hopefully doing my own homework uh, so I'm not just taking advantage of people's time. But um, the work at the Venice Biennale dealt with uh, the communication systems that support nuclear weapons structure in Italy, U.S., NATO, and Italian nuclear weapons infrastructure uh, very rapidly shut down. I learned later, and, and, and I was never told that it was uh, censored. I was told, oh, we have some technical difficulties uh, with this work. Uh, so, um, but during that process and just after, I had uh, some interactions with some people at the Pentagon. And uh, in 1991, during the first Gulf War, as we called it, uh, I talked to uh, some contacts at the Pentagon uh, in their information office and said, I really would like some of your uh, desert blur, forward-looking infrared imagery. Uh, your night vision and surveillance imagery. And, and those FLIR systems were in every Abrams tank, every Apache helicopter, and at uh, headquarters, uh, command headquarters, which were monitoring all of that in real time. 
And uh, uh, so I said, I'd like some desert footage. I don't want to see bombs exploding. I don't want to see battle scenes. I don't want anything that might be classified or sensitive. And uh, my contact at the Pentagon said, uh, okay, Richard, uh, I understand, but uh, you understand we're busy right now. So give us some time. Uh, and he explained the process, all of the video that's shot by these military uh, systems is sent to a repository in Southern California where everything is gone through. And uh, he said, uh, eventually we can send you desert footage, but know that we will have to remove any voice communication and any data on those uh, tapes. Uh, and he said, it might take a few months because we're busy. Fine. Less than a week later, I received three three quarter inch umatic tapes uh, overnight delivery. I looked at them and they were of so called friendly fire. Joshua mentioned fire before. <laughs> That's what provoked me. Yeah, uh, uh, they sent me three tapes of uh, our and Europeans uh, actually uh, killing our own troops. Uh, by accident, uh, but because of information uh, imperfections of sorts and the human element in that process. Uh, and um, what was interesting was the tapes all had voice communication. They all had data. Uh, you could tell the distance at which they were looking at targets at 10,000 meter distances. Uh, and uh, I realized they were using uh, um, telescopic optics, uh, 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 satellite optics, terrestrially, and rectifying for horizon and so on distortions. And we were actually uh, seeing the data as to uh, information about the targets. We we're hearing the voices of the Apache helicopters, the Abrams tanks, and Command Central uh, about all this. And they were saying, oh, uh, they're not friendlies. Take them out. Take them out. Uh, and they're going, well, they're here. They're there. Uh, eventually, anyway, it was horrific. I, it's, it's what I termed pornography. Uh, and um, I, I, I immediately, after looking at these and realizing they sent me this stuff, which wasn't what I had asked for, uh, they said, uh, I, I called my contact at the Pentagon and I said, uh, you know, uh, Major uh, Jones, uh, uh, I just got these tapes. And usually he was very friendly with me and we would have conversation, brief conversations, even if he was busy, like just prior to that. Uh, this time I said, I just got the tapes. And he went, mm hmm. And I said, uh, but. This isn't what I asked for. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually he said, do what you will with them. Uh, I was being used as a leak uh, for sensitive data. Uh, and I think he knew, actually, I probably told him just a few weeks before that, uh, as the Gulf War was building up, I had done some consulting for ABC News Nightline, Ted Koppel's program. Uh, sort of, and they paid for a trip to New York where I turned uh, journalists, photo journalists uh, and uh, video journalists onto night vision systems. Uh, uh, and I, I had a Litton uh, defense contractor night vision system, a, a mil spec system, and uh, that I was using creatively. Uh, but uh, I said, I, I'm, I'm also seeing, you're looking at targets 10,000 meters away. Uh, you're using unique uh, uh, optics now to, to see at those distances. And he said, oh, you realize that? Uh, well, if you're interested, then he opened up a bit and he said, if you're interested, you might talk to Captain so-and-so at DIA. And I said, you want me to call DIA? <laughs> Defense Intelligence Agency? And uh, he said, well, let me call... Uh, uh, the captain first and uh, call him this afternoon. He'll expect your call. And uh, I called that afternoon. I talked to the guy about the uh, 
optical systems they're using, and uh, and yet they did not recognize the target they were looking at, and in fact took out our own our own troops, our own uh, tank. Uh, and you could, uh, and and I was seeing all the video through uh, FLIR forward-looking infrared eyes, far infrared uh, video, remarkable video. Uh, and uh, the captain said, uh, "Oh, you see that, huh?" Well, I said, "Well, wh what's the solution to these kind of problems?" He said, "Oh, we need more levels of AI. We've got to get rid of the human element. We need more AI." This was 1991. Uh, and, and uh, I, I thought that was a both fascinating set of communications that I was having, but also the whole context for that. I know around that time, I also spent some time at the RAND Corporation, talking to people there who were very involved with information warfare uh, work and so on. I'm still in touch with one of those people. And uh, uh, yeah, that work was just fascinating to me and actually also creatively fascinating, produced a big body of work, but it, it really, uh, you know, at that time, I really became immersed in the nature of disinformation and uh, and a AI application to actually uh, replace human decision-making uh, under those circumstances. I think uh, very, you know, a really difficult balancing act uh, in many ways. But uh, I know that, uh, and we have a session coming up in this uh, series uh, on Thursday, uh, August 1st, later this week, uh, with a group uh, that I've met from Helsinki, Finland, uh, and they're called Artists with Evidence. And uh, they're going to be talking to a friend of mine that they haven't met. So it'll be a get to know you conversation between three members of Artists with Evidence and my friend Issa Niafaga from Cameroon. And Issa, born in a traditional village, uh, his father was Islamic, had seven wives. Uh, he grew up with the women of that village, uh, never knew which of those was his actual mother. Uh, luckily got an education and he went uh, and became a political cartoonist in Cameroon. Mm. And for his work, he was imprisoned and tortured. And, uh, and he has a great story to tell about information warfare, information. Uh, one of the things, I'll just wind this up so we can open to the two of you. Um, one of the things that concerns me is that real conflict, real warfare, real trauma takes at least two generations to overcome, I, I think. It's not a, a quick healing process when you actually experience physical warfare, death of relatives, children, uh, the trauma of bombing, all of that. I, I grew up in uh, Israel, Palestine, British, British Mandate, Palestine. And among the earliest recollections I have is of uh, oil, uh, oil barrels being rolled down the hills to uh, homes, uh, set a fire, uh, the oil drums were set on fire and rolled down the hillside toward our homes. Uh, and I, I know the trauma of that that was uh, present. And I think the same is true of information warfare, that whether it's traumatic or not, I think the healing of that takes much more than a generation or two. It's embedded in our systems. It's, uh, it's, it's reproduced. It's, uh, I mean, it's a really dauntingly concerning uh, problem in our world you know, uh, in terms of the time scale required to address these issues of uh, of our cognitive environment being assaulted in some it's way. It's epigenically uh, expressed, right? Exactly. And epigenically then, you expressed. Know, and then you actually have generations uh, that are reacting to the expression of those genes, you know, far many years after, right? the original insult. I mean, we can look, I'm sure that Joshua, I mean, you, you, your presentation was just exceptional. Uh, really, really, really um, 
and am grateful for it. My mother was in OSS OSI uh, in World War II uh, because she could play music and they thought that she could, you know, uh, basically do deciphering and decoding uh, like a lot of them did. Um, but I, I kept thinking, I kept trying to find these moments sort of of healing. And I don't know, of course, you both remember the fairness doctrine, right? It was introduced in what, 47? And they repealed it in 87. And then it was completely taken off the books in 11, uh, which of course required, you know, all of the broadcast channels to basically do sort of, you know, um, uh, even in fair reporting across. So as a child, you know, we would, li we, I would watch, um, my grandmother refused to make dinner on Sunday night during the Vietnam war. Um, and we all had to have TV dinners and, and sit in front of the television and actually watch the body count, the scroll mm -hmm. and pay absolute close attention to every single name that went by sort of as a, uh, as a, as a place of silence, as a place, a place of respect. Um, and just thinking through what Joshua was talking about uh, and even like how I could almost sort of flip the switch in my own work, right? By taking a single letter away, by making what we've always done, which is going there, which seems very, you know, <laughs> colonial, right? Um, uh, and, you know, and taking a single letter away. Um, I don't know how much you've studied cognitive behavioral methodology, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, but there's a gentleman at the University of Washington called John Gottman uh, and runs the Gottman Institute. And he's quite fascinating. I always wanted to do a PhD with him and to apply his um, uh, his science, his CBT science to institutions, right? Which are you know large organizations rather than couples. Uh, but he has this fascinating group that can look at a couple over a period of four hours with video cameras and a number of psychologists, and they can determine within fairly close accuracy, about 95%, 99%, if they're going to get divorced, right? And so at the core of that, right, there's fundamental science uh, behind, you know, cognitive behavioral methodology. The brain is what the brain makes. And getting to your notion, Joshua, of what it takes to heal, right? Because we healed, we didn't, we never really fully healed after the Civil War, the U.S. Civil War, right? We're watching all of that still sort of foment. Um, and then, you know, what do we describe, you know, uh, it, you know, clinically as healing, right? A complete sort of, you know, forgotten, or do we forgive, you know what I mean? Or what are those things? And then you, you know, think about, you know, historically families that have had alcoholism or drug addiction. And that's what I was drawing from, from the notion of epigenetic expression. They might not have been around, you know, physical bombs or hot war, right? Um, uh, or, uh, but they they had an experience, right, which uh, changed the way in which their genes are expressed. And fundamentally, those, you know, changed the way in which the progeny uh, that come afterwards, um, you know, are... Uh, uh, they're the embodiment of that initial insult, even though they're living years, decades, centuries, millennia afterwards, uh, it gets, you know, written inside of us. Uh, and I'd be really fascinated to, you know, hear, you know, uh, what you, you know, your, your team might be thinking, but I have to admit, admit in the back of my head, I'm already converting everything that I do into possible, whether it's, you know, the, um, my wife is involved in cybersecurity. I can't say really what it is she, she does. Uh, but, um, uh, she keeps mostly the headlines that we fear from, from for happening. She keeps them from happening. Um, so that's kind of what she's involved with. Um, but I hear a lot, right? And um, I uh, uh, my head immediately flipped to like the fairness doctrine, right? To uh, Citizens United, all of these things that ever so slightly they tilt uh, the topography, right, of information into a way where you almost have, it's not that it runs out of control, right? It's an accelerant though. It sort of shifts the gravity, right? And sort of tilts it or pushes it towards an accelerant rather than something that has like a kind of a homostasis where there's enough time balance, right? That you can uh, consider sort of these truths and, and the notion of we live in a world, I often, you know, I won't say jokingly, I talk to my students a lot and I say, you know, you have to you have to compete with cats on YouTube playing piano. We're in a world where you can't be interesting anymore. Uh, you have to be interested, right? Which is a fundamentally different, you know, orientation. Uh, and there's so much. I won't even call it information. It's just data 
uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't have um, insight, right? So then it comes down to trusted channels. And then, you know, humans by and large, if you look at CBT, we're hardwired to defend and we're hardwired to basically, you know, uh, justify, right? Uh, and we justify the things that we defend and they sort of are self, um, uh, they're, uh, they're a positive feedback loop that amplifies, um, you know, those behaviors, you know, precisely the way in which you were, you know, outlining them, Josh. Let me just say one, one thing that you just provoked, Sean, and I'll hand it over to Joshua, but um, you mentioned your mother, uh, OSS, uh, our, our, our network television programming and networks, uh, and people like William S. Paley were part of OSS. They were part of that World War II information infrastructure. Uh, and our network grew out of that. And uh, essentially, programming uh, for the networks was filler between advertising. And uh, the things we're talking about, the psychology of human processes and understanding, were fundamental in the early work of the advertising industry. Uh, so my go. parents, have you seen, Josh, have you seen the television show Mad Men? Mad Men? Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. You probably want to watch it. So not because <laughs> Sorry, not down. because it is it is the expression. My father was Don Draper and my mom was Betty Draper, except she was involved. So they went from long stories, which was theater, right? And symphony. And they came back from World War II and they moved into radio and then television, right? Which are shorter stories, right? 30 minute. And then they moved to advertising in Madison Avenue. So they went from two hour stories to knowing how to craft stories within 15 to 30 seconds, right? Which is the psychology that's used to actually drive, promote, push, um, you know, lifestyle, uh, all of those changes and those hungers. And I think deep down inside of that, it's a, it's a laboratory though it's written, you know, in story form with individuals who are deeply flawed, there's something historical there uh, that's really fascinating because I saw it happen. Uh, you know, beautiful, long Shakespearean stories all of a sudden become, you know, like six words. Uh, and it has a jujitsu, um, you know, capacity to move people and organizations in the direction they're already headed, but faster than they thought they were going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. And like, you know, Sean, I also want to thank you for your talk. I thought it was great. And it reminded me of my time in Santa Fe because there was a um, light show every year at the rail yard and I cannot remember the name of it for life of me, um, but it was absolutely wonderful. And it was, it was, um, it was called Currents. A new yeah, Currents. Festival. That's exactly that right. Yes, one exactly. of the developers of Yeah. Yeah. And I absolutely loved that every year. And a lot of this robotics and like, sort of the mix that you have between engineering and mathematics and science and art. And it's just absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Josh. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, it was really struck me is like, you know, when you're trying to heal from the information warfare, I think part of it is it's a similar to warfare where you have, is it being forgotten or is it forgiveness? You know, is it, do you forget it or do you forgive it? And do you bring peace to the situation or do you not? And, I think one of the things we think about quite a bit is certainty. And, you know, in this country, uh, I don't remember who said it first, but we have a crisis of certainty. If you talk to anybody about politics, they are 100% certain about their view, and you're 100% certain about your view. And one of the things I think to start healing is the same thing you do post, you know, post war when you want to start healing a country is coming together and, you know, having forgiveness. Um, and admitting that, like, what you did was wrong, but what we did was also wrong. And some of what you did was right, and some of what I did was right. And we need to bring the same space to information warfare, where instead of, I'm 100% certain of exactly what I believe politically, it's that I'm going to come to the conversation, and I'm only going to be 80% sure. I really want to hear why you're 80% sure. So then, then you can start mixing those two ideas together. Um, so I think certainty is interesting. When you're talking about tilting the axis, I thought it really struck a chord with me talking, thinking about um, what Russia did in 2016. And they saw the divisions in America and they just tilted the axis a little bit. You know, they just added to that fire. And it's just, you know, there was already all these problems. There's all this kindling, 
all you had to do is like the matches and targeted delivery of ad, ad systems and algorithms allowed them to do this. And, you know, it's like, you know, we were looking at these uh, affinity groups on Facebook, which were basically uh, these group. you get these advertisements of join, join this group with a hundred thousand members and it's for, you know, freedom for America or liberty for the border, just these generic titles that don't mean anything. Um, and what we see was there's pro, there would have been tro pro Trump groups. There was pro Clinton groups or pro, <laughs> pro Clinton groups. Um, and interior to this, you would have agents that would be feeding disinformation that resonated with Clinton supporters, but was wrong. And it pushed them farther from the other side. And you saw pro-Trump information that was 100% disinformation to push these people away from the Clinton people. So just pushing them apart. And what was interesting is that both groups were owned by Russia, in particular, the Russia Internet Agency. And so they didn't care if they were pushing Clinton. They didn't care if they were pushing Trump. What they cared was to push all of us on the information islands so that the United States no longer has a shared reality. And they did a phenomenal job at it. Uh, yeah, and, and lo loss of continuity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you know, the when you're talking about these like massive stories that again kind of got melted down in 15 seconds, that's our entire reality right now. It's this attention economy where you have somewhere between two to 15, maybe 10 seconds to capture somebody's attention, tell them your story, and get your point across. And then they're moving on to the next bit of information without really processing the information you gave them, which really incentivizes them to give you something, you know, clickbaity. It really has to grab you or otherwise you just scroll to the yeah. next post. It has to arrest the imagination. You know, I, I, I'm so used to being drawn into think tanks uh, and uh, sort of pulled into areas that not that, it, that is not my area of expertise, but you know I'm sure you do too, right? We just get pulled into these areas, and I often think of like you know what actually does work, you know. So binge watching television, for example, that may be point casted, but someone's actually spending an enormous amount of time, right, invested yeah. in that. Uh, when we used to go to movie theaters, right, we would sit shoulder to shoulder with a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people, especially if you were, you know, lived in a big city. You know what I mean? And you would have this sort of we would all interpret a film or very differently, the experience differently. But there was some sort of shared component. I'm not being nostalgic. I'm just talking about what were the fundamental pieces that actually do the thing that we're talking about. You know, you buy pizza. Uh, and in an office and somehow you draw people together with sort of a social glue, right? There are these very subtle things. And as you were saying, you know, with the sort of Russian disinformation campaign, they could care less. They wanted to divide. And the goal really is, is that all that it requires is if it's a delicate balance, you don't need to exert an enormous amount of force, right? It takes very, very little to sort of tilt that scale and exactly. makes you wonder if that scale is just as easily tiltable, you know, back again, uh, that, that, that there's a natural, you know, um, inclination. And I don't mean to anthropomorphize it for homostasis, right. For some form of equilibrium. Yeah. Um, though the, you know, uh, there are, I'll just say individuals, you know, in power, uh, that uh, exert uh, an enormous amount of uh, pressure uh, because they have those levers uh, that are available to them. And the loss of that, you know, comes wrapped up in, you know, both their cultural identity, their individual identity. Um, and so it's fascinating because when you mentioned, you know, Elon Musk, you've got a single person who not only has the wealth, but they also have their own media, you know, distribution channels that can target you know, quite specifically and do so somewhat agnostically, but just by raising an eyebrow. That's really what that was. That was just raising an eyebrow. So it, you know, it triggers uh, cortisol, right? Uh, increase. We could probably, you know, measure it in a lab quite nicely uh, to see exactly what threshold requires, right? A particular trigger, then the body has a biological response, you know what I mean? And then the neurochemicals sort of reinforce certain, um, you know, psychological apparatus. And you, you can, you could, you can find those places, I think, to effectively begin to think through what it would take, not necessarily to heal, but the recipe, right. 
for letting the body heal itself or society heal itself, but by balancing things out. Um, not a not an antibiotic to hit with a hammer, right? But you know, homeopathic, um, you know, tools that might actually be there. Something as simple as, you know, Citizens United or the Fairness Doctrine. Could you imagine us turning on at night, you know, and watching, you know, the news, even if it is 15 seconds in a shot? <laughs> it was, it was, you know, both sides like talking, you know, it, it would be, it was a different world. Let me yeah. provoke, a, let me provoke a, a little other side to this same issue. And that is uh, information overload. More and more of society that is unprepared to know how to process information, who hasn't been, I mean, this isn't part of our educational life uh, in most places. Uh, and many people are overwhelmed and unskilled sometimes at dealing with a, a complexity, a daunting complexity of information that surrounds us and that's being generated by everyone has a voice now. So you can just have this cacophony of uh, of information and more and more people, it seems, are responding by turning off, by embracing ignorance to ignore. Uh, and uh, I think that's an incredibly dangerous uh, undertaking uh, to, uh, to because they then rely instead of on truth or facts or attempts at understanding. We're all just attempting to understand. It's an ongoing process. Uh, information is a verb, not a noun. It's dynamic. It's always in process. It's not a thing. Uh, and uh, more and more people who are ignorant are relying on beliefs or whatever those may be they're very personally reinforcing without actually any grounding necessarily uh, i have i had an experience a few years ago um richard josh um i'll leave names out and i'll try to leave as many organizations out but there was a large science organization that received a very large sum of money to put literally millions of sensors on the San Juan de Fuca plate, uh, which is just outside of Seattle. It's the most dynamic tectonic plate in the world, right? And they put so many sensors on it when they threw the switch, they were getting so much through output data. It's like 4D data, right? It's almost inconceivable. And they just shut the door because every time they looked in, it was more and more and more. And they just they couldn't do anything with it. So they worked their way through, you know, uh, applied mathematicians, computer scientists, finally to neuro linguists, like everybody. And then they ended up with my group because they effectively needed, a, you know, Josh, a new semiotic to be able to recognize the information, decipher what's of value, right? To look for insight. So the one thing I didn't mention with the project for Mars because it's just so layered. I, I mean, I could probably listen to Josh. I'd love to take a, a grad seminar with you and just listen. Um, the, the robot, right? So when the astronauts actually leave Earth's atmosphere within about six weeks to about three months, the cerebral spinal fluid no longer has um, atmospheric and gravitational pull, right? So it drifts up to the back of the skull, presses on... Um, the dura, right? And then starts to flatten the eyes out. So everybody, there's not a single astronaut that's not going to come, you know, hit Mars and be totally blind, right? They will be able to see like microscopes, but they can't see at a distance. And one of the things that the Magnaforma robot actually does, it's a new semiotic, right? Because it will actually read, you'll be able to read the entire topography of the whole planet, all of it not in a highly abstracted form, but in a way that because of the curiosity AI, it sort of almost behaves like discovery, right? But it still follows the same contours. And so in many ways, right, we're already talking about how this can be used to navigate um, in um, an environment 
where our biology is so fundamentally different, right? That we actually have to, I mean, a doctor does it, right? When you look at a CT scan, a radiologist has to be able to look at it very differently than a, than a radiologist who looks at MRs, uh, a um, ultrasound technician, right? Because the image is actually anamorphically distorted, right? If you put a mirrorized cylinder at the base of the, um, like if you've ever seen, you know, like a scan for a fetus, right? It has like a cone shape, right? With a curve on the top. But if you put a mirror eye cylinder there, it would actually wrap around it and you could see it three-dimensionally rather than sort of having to distort your mind to be able to read that. And so there's something about that that makes me think that, you know, when these folks came to us and they had way too much data and they didn't know how to use it, right? Because they just thought more was better and it really wasn't. They needed, and you know, you're one of your slides that said that the semaphore group, right? The semiotics forensics, you know, it starts to be the key players, right? Who are going to ultimately know how to not just simply, you know, parse it at light speed, right? But be able to come up with metaphors and with tools that allow you to peer in and not just to do it by brute force, right? Train our kids to be able to actually recognize and analyze, you know, AI simply, you know, line by line because they can see that it's not accurate. It has, you know, features or characters about it that, you know, it doesn't read truthfully, right? But there are, I think ultimately, um, you know, um, uh, are, are either one of you um, bilingual, trilingual, Josh? No, no, Richard, you are. Yeah. So I speak German and some Japanese. And the thing is, is that as a child, I had to convert, right? You have to do this thing because your brain, it, like the words don't exist. Like in Japanese, you would, you would insult someone if you, let's say you had a, a friend and they gave you a compliment. And then you said to them, like, you have beautiful eyes, but you said that in English and Japanese because they would start vomiting because ultimately, you know, you're supposed to say you have beauty in your eyes because otherwise you're, you're complimenting them on their optic nerve, right? And all the blood vessels and the actual, you know, um, object. So you have to learn how to convert. Um, and German is very, it has its own, um, you know, variant of that. I was trying to think of the Japanese, which is kanajwa uh, mega um, kiridesu. Uh, which means you have beauty in your eye. You would never say, right, like you you have a nice organ <laughs> or you have a nice, you know, optic nerve. Um, so like the semiotics, knowing when, you know, what cultural, you know, lenses you observe that through and how you derive the filtering, right, which might give insight uh, to be able to peer more deeply, more rapidly into the information than just by brute force. Sorry, I went on a bit of a tear there because you 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 got me inspired. Josh, I mean, one of the like you know really interesting aspects of what you said. I mean, there's a lot of things, but it's this idea that you know more data is not more information, and I think that's a really important concept in all science, right? So, like on this uh, you know plate that you're talking about, or on you know, dynamical systems or in whatever other robotics you want to, it's, it's not necessarily the case that all data carries information. And, you know, I mean, this was, uh, this is precisely what Claude, Claude Shannon was talking about is that like some data has information and some doesn't. And like, yeah. you have to be able to differentiate that. And if you have, you know, 70, uh, sensors and they're, you know, 30% noisy, or you have 700,000 sensors and 30% noise, you still have to filter all that out. It's not that you can get away from it. Right. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't think about, you know, um, is that a lot of times like adding in more data just makes the problem worse, especially if they're non observed like non-predictive variables. And so it's like, you add in, you add into your system, you're really just adding in entropy. You're not adding in predictive data. Uh, and I think it's really interesting that they saw that with the plates that like, how do you, how do you dig through this? Um, and I think you see that all throughout science right now is that more data is king, uh, not necessarily more information. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I studied for a very long time was how do you quantify predictive information and how do you quantify what about the past is going to tell you about the future? So, for example, uh, in the ice core work, uh, it's very different than Sean's ice core work. <laughs> but I mean, kind of, sort of, not really. Like we were kinda trying to quantify. Really. 
the information content of ice cores that we pulled out of Antarctica. And what we were really interested in was how much information is being transmitted through that core uh, over time. So yes. does the past core tell you about the future core? Um, and we had some of like, you know, some of the challenges that you ran into, Sean, if you talked about that, like that, you know, in the fern, the compression is a lot different than down low. And as you get lower and lower, you have more compression. And like yeah. you start not being able to see about year to year. And what does that do with the ice and the water structures? Um, I've got million year samples that we cloned that are so noisy, right? That they literally just look like they're almost, uh, they're stunning to look at. Um, yeah. But the goal in our lab was actually to be able to encode data inside of the dendrites, right? So we're sort of going the opposite direction. You were trying to soothsay out of what you had. We right. were actually trying to, you know, go from, you know, single, you know, um, monocrystals, right, that are doped that we could then ultimately add information into, right? If, you know, I don't want to be too futuristic, but for example, if we're, you know, traveling, uh, well beyond our solar system, you know, deep into other parts of the galaxy or the universe, you know, how are we going to take information with us, right? What's going to last? Uh, do we do it through biological systems where it's storytelling, which is inherently noisy, you know? Um, do we do it through, you know, genes and through, um, uh, you know, uh, replication? Um, but we were studying the idea that we would be able to have ice that would last for a very, very long time. And the dendrites, you know, the way in which, you know, we could, in, in, in effect, think of it this way. I could have us all in class four Tyvek suits, right? Like ultra clean environment, pull out some solenoids, allow some contamination in and sort of produce, you know, a unique, you know, ice crystal. We can take a little tiny dendrite off and take a swimming pool full of water that's colder than freezing and ultra pure and you dangle it over there and you drop it in, it's dying, right? To go through a phase change. It must go through, it will at minus 41 degrees. It'll homogeneously nucleate, but it will not look like anything anybody's ever seen. It's kind of gray. You've seen these Joshua, right? They just don't look right. But you drop that tiny dendrite in and bam, and it doesn't do through do it through dissipation, heat dissipation, no other process. It just simply uses it as a blueprint. And then wham, it is all the way down to the very smallest part, you know, the version of itself from the original piece. And, you know, the part that I didn't really talk about, and this kind of comes into, you know, I don't want to sound monastic and how I filter my universe, um, but I apply a sort of a systems aesthetic to my artwork. And systems aesthetic is not necessarily Jack Burnham. Jack Burnham had the initial idea, but for me, systems aesthetic is that I'm actually responsible all the way down to the quantum, right? And all the way up to the largest scale structures in the universe. And I, I think you can tell just by the way in which I present my work and what I've done, I'm not fooling here, right? I went to MIT and I have a serious science degree. And so the idea that, you know, you go all the way down and you're responsible, right, for that for the, even the kernel level, right? At the programming level, all the way out, um, uh, whether it's a, a computational system or whether it's a, a physical system. And there's an inherently different sort of mental, uh, almost spiritual approach, right? To the level of responsibility that you are operating in because you can see the laws of unintended consequence. You can see the other patterns uh, that emerge when it changes scale, right? When it jumps from the microscopic to the macroscopic to the you know um, ultra large, um, and so I keep I keep coming back. Uh, there's like parts of my mind that are parsing your your presentation and finding ways that are not necessarily brute force denial, right? Uh, to be able to sort of pr protect and to parse, but to find ways to even out. Uh, almost like a vista, where do you stand to where, where do you stand and at what point in a system, right? And where do you have the most leverage? And it may not be at the beginning and it may not be at the end. It may not be in the middle, right? Um, uh, some of you have maybe gone to, I have a really phenomenal uh, um, uh, physiotherapist and you'll go in and it's like, my ankle hurts. And they'll be like, well, it's actually your neck, you know, and they'll do three things here, you know, and then all of a sudden it's, it's because of all this compensation, right? And it's a fascinating thing to look at a system and be um, aware that, you know, you might be missing the finger for what you're pointing at, 
I'm sure you see that a lot, Josh. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think it's a funny example with the physical therapist. My wife's a physical therapist. And so <laughs> if I go in and say my ankle hurts, she's like, why didn't you do your exercises? I told you to do. So um, I, get, I get a different response than the, than the standard patients. Um, so but yeah, me, Richard, go ahead. Well, we're coming to a close of this. We have a few minutes, but uh, I'd like to throw a, a sort of a final big question out. And that is, I'm hearing... Uh, that we know a lot about the problems that we face, especially in this arena. Uh, and yet, what are steps forward to address these problems? I don't want to use the word solutions. I'm very concerned about people who have solutions. Uh, but, uh, but how do we get on a different path? Or do we? Can we? I mean, the, the issue is so large and so dynamically complex and most people are, um, unlike Sean, are not prepared to develop a sense of responsibility for themselves in terms of a, a personal ethic, a personal development of filtering, a personal lifelong learning process, all of which are necessary. Uh, are there steps forward to address these? this, which is a, just a major problem? I mean, I think we've brought up a lot of problems, Richard. Can you tell can you tell us which one you're talking about? <laughs> oh, just take any of them or all of them. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we're at a we're at a point now that um in the information space that I work in, uh nobody knows what to trust about anything. And you know, you're talking about this information shutoff, Richard, where um you know, you, or maybe Sean, I'm not sure, but um, basically talking about that you just don't look at any information anymore. You just shut down. And I think that's the place that a lot of people are getting to because you look at, um, you know, even with, uh, you know, a present example, like the Donald Trump assassination, there's a huge number of people who are talking about that he was not actually shot. And now what's coming out are these images that show his ears perfectly intact. And now people are saying either they're die hard that yes, he got shot. And yes, that's just what it looked like afterwards. But there's a lot of people that are critically thinking about it and saying like, well, is that even a picture from now? Who took this picture? When did they take this picture? And you no longer trust your eyes. You no longer trust your reality at all, right? It's like, okay, the AP posted this. Okay, but when did they take the picture? When did they post it? Um, and so it's interesting that we're getting to a point where the information's overloaded to such a degree, we don't want to look at any information. It's not that we want to cut down the information, we just want to cut it off. Um, I think, you know, there's, I think media literacy will partially fix this. I think having people understand how to digest their environment, countering bad information, but not censoring it, I think is a solution to the space. Yeah. Um, censoring it does nothing but bad things. Um, you know, it makes them feel unheard. It justifies their conspiracy theory and moves them to darker platforms. I mean, just all over the board, it's a bad idea. Um, but I think really the idea is like, we have to talk to each other, not through a computer. Like, I need to go find someone from the opposing political party and sit them down and say, how do you feel about this? This is what's happening. Um, because what we, what we often find on these information islands is that people from the other side simply don't know the facts that you do. It's not that they're ignorant. It's not that they're misled, that they're incapable. They just have a different reality than you. Um, and I think being willing to sit down and have awkward, hard conversations without yelling and just coming together and having civil communication is the only way to fix something like this. And banning social media, that's probably important too. <laughs> There's a small anecdote uh, when Magellan crossed the Straits in southern Chile uh, that the native peoples uh, actually didn't see them. They had to really make quite a ruckus. Uh, it's in some of the notes that are written, and it comes down to an effect to that we don't see what we see. We see our system of seeing it, right? 
Uh, we actually are seeing the, the cognitive structure that has been built for us through both society, through language, right? Language just plays a huge part. The, our brains get hardwired by language. That's why I was talking about learning how to, you know, speak German and think in German, which is really different, you know, in Deutsch than it is in English. The, the creative mind functions very differently. And so, you know, to your point about doing it, Joshua, with people like in our biology next to one another. Um, and the other, you know, part of it is, is whether it's through literacy or whether it's through just a profound, you know, uh, sort of uh, inclusion of understanding that we're not really seeing what we see, right? We are seeing the system, right? Our social structures. And it's not a, a form of literacy. It's about, a, it's social literacy. It's not necessarily information literacy. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And knowing sort of uh, how our, um, uh, uh, how humanity evolved and how it's very, very different in very different places. And I've lived in other countries. It's very strange to like all of a sudden give up your health care here and become part of something else. I've lived, you know, when I lived in Canada, you can buy a multi-million dollar home with two pieces of paper. I live here in Virginia and you had, uh, we literally to do a title, uh, a title would be four or 500 pages because it ultimately goes back to, you know, Thomas Jefferson's dad owning it. Right. And you literally, you have, you must go through and, and put a signature on every single one of those pieces of paper. And so it's like it culturally, they're just different. You can't get a 30 year loan in Canada. You get five years max. Right. So all of these structures, they seem like uniform everywhere. They just simply are in Germany. We pay our, our uh, utilities a month in advance. We don't pay them after we receive them. Right. And all of those fundamentally shift how you see the world. Um, I'm going to have to thank you both. Um, I'll end with a a few uh, thoughts. Uh, First, for those who are still tuned into this, uh, we have a great session tomorrow on the sounds and senses of life, monitoring uh, plants, my uh mushrooms fungal matter uh uh, animal communications of various sorts and uh also the current new application of ai to interpretation of meaning out of uh this incredible wealth of information coming from other living things and their ability to communicate so that's tomorrow uh and also on wednesday we have a session on the inform the economics of information, uh, uh, a really critical area that's barely being addressed. I mentioned yesterday that at the beginning of the Clinton-Gore administration, I went to a meeting at the Department of Commerce on uh, what is the new digital economy. And after a couple of days of working meetings, uh, government uh, officials and corporate uh, representatives and academics decided, oh, uh, the digital economy, oh, um, information is property. Uh, and as such, we don't have to change patent laws. We don't have to change copyright. We don't have to think differently. Information is uh, like learning, like health, like family raising, an intangible and externality. Uh, it's not like material goods. And uh, I think we're going to have a different perspective on uh, Wednesday. Uh, so anybody tuning in, uh, look at the website, look at the schedule. There's some great presentations coming up over the next few days. And I'm going to end this with, uh, I mentioned before, uh, I was working uh, uh, on a project about information warfare and information theory back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, I did a, a piece for three talk, a theater piece for three talking computers. Uh, I was working with computer speech and speech recognition and a little bit of early versions of AI uh, to do that. And at the end of this theater piece, one of the computers uh, told a joke. It actually retold a joke. It didn't make it up. And I'll end with this joke. And it's uh, essentially, I won't use a computer voice. I'll use my voice. But uh, at a recent conference on uh, Uh, At MIT, in fact, uh, the distinguished linguist uh, Noam Chomsky ended a presentation by saying, and remember, two negatives always equal a positive, but two positives never equal a negative, whereupon somebody in the audience said, yeah, yeah.
So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Tune into some of the others. Participate a bit if you Thank like. You. Thank, Thank you, Joshua, very much. Thank, Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. That was great. Really inspired.